I remember when I interviewed this publisher and, and they were talking about voice, that she said it was, she described it as a confidence thing. You know, it wasn't, she wasn't interested in being, you know, knocked out of the park by an amazing kind of opening sentence or, or, or some kind of big idea. It was like a quiet self-confidence that this person knew who they were and knew the world and knew what they wanted to write about. And that's what kind of pulled her in. And I think that's, as a writer, I, I find that really encouraging that it's not like I've got to come up with some, as in a death-defying opening sentence. Welcome to Wild Muse, Tom. Thanks for joining me here. Thank you for having me. I'm really eager today to talk about the art of voice in writing and how writers might craft an authentic or distinct voice. And also, I suppose, at the same time, balancing creativity with market demands, so to speak. So let's start, first of all, Tom, if you're happy, just to define what you would call an authentic or a distinct voice with, you know, perhaps a little bit of your editor hat, your writer's hat and your ghostwriter's hat. That is a very big question, actually, uh, in, in a strange way. It's a small question, but a big question. Um, I remember doing a couple of interviews with, uh, with, a, with a publisher and a literary agent when they were accepting kind of submissions of manuscripts and asked what they looked for. Uh, and both of them said that the first thing they looked for when, the, when they read those opening pages was voice. So it wasn't the plot, it wasn't the characters, but it's the voice, the thing that stood out. And they're both very clear on that. But then I said, well, what do you mean by voice? And they both sort of gave this slightly kind of garbled description, sort of. And I think remember the literary agent saying, um, you know it when you see it, which I, which I think is fantastically unhelpful for kind of people kind of wanting to, to write. Um, when I teach, and I, and I think for me, one of the best uh, descriptions of voice, uh, comes from Raymond Carver, who's an American kind of short story writer who was uh, a big influence on me when I started writing and he wrote a fantastic little essay called On Writing in a book called Fires. Uh, and it's, I'm going to read you just a very, very short paragraph because actually I think this is as close as, as anything that, that gets when you, when you describe what voice is. Um, and he says, um, every great or even every very good writer makes the world over according to his own specifications. It's akin to style, what I'm talking about, but it isn't style alone. It's the writer's particular and unmistakable signature on everything that he writes. It is his world and no other. And this is one of the things that distinguishes one writer from another. Not talent, there's plenty of that around, but a writer who has some special way of looking at things and who gives artistic expression to that way of looking, that writer may be around for some time. And I think for me, I think that's a really good description. It, it's a, it's a specific and a unique way of kind of looking at the world. There's elements of style in terms of how you write, uh, but it's more than that. It's about humor. It's about observation. It's about what you witness. Um, it's your own take on, on everything. Um, so it's not really a kind of a grand thematic thing. I don't think particularly it's the kind of small things that pull together and it's not it's not an easy thing to describe and to go back to that agent. I do think you sort of know it when you see it to an extent. Um, and I think when you're starting to write, sometimes we have this, this story or this, this, this idea that you have to find your voice as though it's something that you, it's, it's down the back of the sofa or something. And actually I think it's a slightly different process. I think it tends to be a, a thinning down of what you're writing and kind of editing it down. And then you find a bit like a, you know, a sculptor with a block of block of stone. You know, they carve away and, and then the voice is within rather than something you have to go out externally and look for, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. I love that. I'm going to just make a note of that to come back to this idea of thinning down. And also, Tom, thank you for sharing that about the agent, because I too have heard agents or when I've looked at their submissions page, they say voice is number one. And like you, they're not giving you that clear definition. But... I love that you read that extract from Raymond Carver. I'm a huge fan of his as well. Good. This phrase makes the world over to me seems to really sum it up because you're taking something that everybody knows. Maybe it's a story, maybe it's a, a description of something, but you're making it yours. And to me, I think 
that's when I know I'm reading a distinct voice, when they're describing something that up until that point I thought I knew, and suddenly I'm like, I've never seen it like that before. I think that's exactly right. And I think you, that that's the excitement when you read and you feel you've got, you know, something fresh and distinctive. And I don't think it needs to be um, anything big and complicated quite often. So one of the, one of the books I teach from, uh, kind of Normal People by Sally Rooney, who I think is a fantastic writer, but again, at describing very, very simple, small things quite often, they're, they're not kind of big things. She chooses her words very carefully, very simply. Uh, but that use of kind of specific language really helps to kind of bring bring out the world as she sees it. And she's got a very, you know, definite way of, of, of seeing that world. But it's not done in a, in a complicated way or a showy off way. I think that's the other thing. I remember when I interviewed this, this publisher and, and they were talking about voice that she said it was, she described it as a confidence thing. You know, it wasn't, she wasn't interested in being you know, knocked out of the park by an amazing kind of opening sentence or, or, or some kind of big idea. It was like a quiet self-confidence that this person knew who they were and knew the world and knew what they wanted to write about. And that's what kind of pulled her in. And I think that's, yeah. as a writer, I, I find that really encouraging that it's not like I've got to come up with some, I don't know, death-defying opening sentence that kind of has some kind of amazing plot twist. It's about capturing the world as it is in a specific and unique way. And for me, I think that's how I teach and that's how I try to write anyway in, in terms of voice yes and also that speaks to me of the danger that we can get into when we read great literature and we think oh that's how i have to be in order to be great so we try to emulate we might use language that isn't unique to us and so we end up emulating a voice rather than as you say that sort of thinning down to find our own voice yeah, and I think there's lots of examples of that, not just in in writing, but in music as well. So, uh, one of my favourite artists is, is Bob Dylan, who I've followed for for years. But when he started uh, playing and singing, he was very much copying and aping uh, people like Woody Guthrie. You know, it, it was the kind of the American folk kind of protest singers. And if you listen to his early albums, you can hear that he's kind of mimicking and copying that style. And it was only as he grew and developed as a writer that, that then he. He found his own style, he found his own, his own voice, and he came out. So I, I think quite often when you start to write, it's very easy to emulate stuff that's already around all there. Um, and it's only through writing and learning that you then kind of learn to step away from that. And it feels safer because you know this this artist or this musician or this writer is successful. So if you write like them, then hopefully you will be successful too. And it feels slightly scarier, I think to sort of stand on your own two feet um, and, and try it out for yourself. Yeah. I actually, for today, chose my own Raymond Carver quote because I okay. think I remembered you mentioning that you were a, a Carver fan and I thought it might be useful to bring it in at this point because you've mentioned Sally Rooney and I love her kind of very minimal slight style. And I mean, she's very different to Raymond Carver, but they're both to me speaking of the confidence of being brief and minimal. So his phrase, get in, get out, don't linger. That to me suggests that focus on brevity, that focus on precision, that focus on knowing exactly what it is you're trying to say, exactly what it is you're going in to get. So I'm curious, how might that principle really help someone capture that authentic voice in writing? If we're thinking about making their world theirs and no other, kind of getting in, getting out and, and not lingering. I think part of it's through observing. I, I think observation is, is often the, the, the starting point of uh, imagination. So observing and observing better, uh, I think. Uh, I remember going um, uh, sort of forest bathing or tree bathing, however you have, what, I can't remember the precise uh, phrase, but it, w it was one of those experiences where as part of it, I was given a tree to look at for, for 10 minutes. Uh, and I remember at the start thinking, well, this just looks like a tree and this is, you know, I can see it's a tree. And then about halfway through after about five minutes, you have this magical moment where suddenly the tree starts to come alive and you see things that you haven't noticed, uh, before. Um, and there was a very similar description of, um, it was David Hockney. Uh, there's a book by Will Gompertz called, um, what I think it's called something like ways the artists, where you are to see the world. And, and Hockney took him to his, the, the woods in, in, in Yorkshire where he, where he paints with all his amazing colors. 
and little converts couldn't see the colours at all. But again, after about sort of 10 minutes or so, then I guess the, the, the light from the sun was coming through the trees and suddenly you could see all these different colours there. So I think the first thing I would say is to observe and observe better um, as, as a starting point to give you that kind of raw material to write with. Um, I then think uh, a lot of writing is in the rewriting. So it's going back through using those words uh, carefully and specifically uh, and precisely. I think Graham McCarver often uses the word precise. The use of commonplace uh, words, uh, getting the right words in there. Um, using the right, um, the right nouns, in particular the right verbs, I think. So rather than, so it's coloring your language with, with adverbs and adjectives, letting the, the, the basics of the sentence do the work for you. If you get the right noun there, you get the right verb there. That does a lot of the work for you and helps also to make those sentences simple, uh, and adds the more, well, the more verbs you get in there, you, you get more movement in the, in the piece, which is, a, which is a slightly different. Uh, point, but I think I think that sort of that thinning down for me is yeah. getting rid of the frippery, and also that almost what people feel is kind of rightly when they start, they feel they, you know, the text should be full of you know images and metaphors and you know clever words and all this kind of stuff. And actually, I think as as you as the more you write and you look at writers like Sally Rooney or Raymond Carver, you can see how they're happy and comfortable with using simple language but they've they've worked hard to find that language there mm. uh, and i remember early on when i when i started writing that someone telling me that um something that's easy to read isn't easy to write uh, and, and i think that's very very true and you can look at this language i think well there's nothing they're not using any kind of big fancy words there but actually the amount of work that's gone in to make that text straightforward and and, and simple and clean uh is is a lot of work that you don't see uh, but that's what makes the, the text strong, uh, and that's what creates the the, the voice. Uh, to go back to your question, Mark. Yeah, lovely. That example of the forest bathing is great because it makes the distinction between describing something and sort of putting everything in, but then really finding that point that you want that reader's attention to to go to. And that I suppose the less is more. It's like, yes, you can describe everything in the image or you can just describe a few things. And thank you for mentioning verbs because that was one of the most beautiful bits of editing advice that you gave for my opening chapters when you looked at them this summer. That difference between someone making their way from one point to another versus scampering or slouching and suddenly you've got a better image and you've just changed the verb so i think yeah it's it's often overlooked we think our oh, voice is all about adjectives but thank you for mentioning verbs because i've become a bit of a verb lover since our our conversation well i think you can do a lot with verbs, and I, I think the more verbs you can get into the uh into the mix that the better I and mean, i think for me a lot of writing is about movement and creating movement in the mm. text and, and verbs give you movement. Uh, and the more specific and the more active you can make those verbs, the stronger the material is. And one of the things I always tell my students, when you go back, go to rewriting, look specifically at the verbs. And it's, it sounds such a small thing to do to go back and change those, but it has this ripple effect through the text when you, when you change those to, to verbs that are more dynamic and more specific. Um, mm. so yeah, I'm a big advocate of verbs too. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's talk about now. So we've sort of had a lovely dive into authentic voice. And I love this idea of making the world over, thinning down, bringing in those verbs. But what about the tension between authentic voice and possibly the pressure to cater to trends? You know, what, what's going to sell? So how would you navigate that balance between authentic voice what's going to sell when you're editing and when you're writing in, in terms of writing i'm not sure i think when i when i when i when i teach writing as well I, I i i i do try and tell my students not to think about the market at all um i think you've got to write the book that you want to write um and if that lands with a with a publisher or what ch if it chimes with what people are looking for at that moment fantastic but you can't you can't second guess the market. Uh, and I was talking to, uh, an editor last week, uh, going to work on it, on a book that he's got. Um, and 
I said, oh, when's it going to be published? And he kind of looked at the schedule and he said, oh, it's going to be out in, in, in March 2027. Um, and that's, 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 I mean, that is a particularly long time, but it's not totally unusual. Um, and I'm not a soothsayer. I can't predict what would be in, um, in terms of kind of style, in terms of genre, um, you know, two and a half years down the line. So I think if you're second guessing, such as the time lag between writing and getting published, that you're on a hiding to nothing if you're trying to copy what is around or what you think is kind of trendy uh, at the moment. So I would, I would personally kind of steer uh, away from that uh, as much as possible. I think there are some uh, kind of wider trends. Uh, so one thing that uh, has definitely happened in the last 10, 15 years is a move towards more books being written in in the first person point of view and in the and in the present tense. I think if you think about genres such as uh, kind of young adult and psychological thrillers, a lot of those tend to be written with that viewpoint and that tense situation. Uh, and I think particularly the present tense is something that feels more of the moment, uh, I would say, than, than it has been. I think if you look back historically, I think most books would be written in, in, in the third, in, in the past tense, excuse me. Um, so that has, that has felt a, a shift. And I think if you're writing in particular genres like that, then there may be things to kind of copy or think, okay, well, if I'm writing a psychological thriller, this should probably be written in in the first person in the present tense to create that sense of experience uh but generally i yeah i don't don't chase trends i think i think when you do that you end up with a book that you're not completely happy or comfortable with mm -hmm. um and then you know even if it even if it sells then you're still feeling well it's not really me uh and i think generally uh an editor or reader can sniff out uh that you're going through the motions rather than writing the book that you really want to write yeah, thanks for sharing that, Tom, that encouragement to really stay true to that uniqueness that we all have. And I think also, if we go back to that Carver quote, there was that phrase, his world and no other. So again, it really comes back to actually when you are describing things as you see them or as your character sees them, when it's your world, nobody else's world, I think that's what's going to make an agent go, oh my God, I like I've never read anything like this. Yeah, I mean, I just think, what's the point? You know, I mean, if, you, if you're writing a novel, it's a lot of time and effort. Um, so if you're creating something that isn't you or something that you think is going to sell but not what you want to write, I don't know, I can't, you know, life's short. I, I can't see the point of doing that myself. Yeah, and it's hard enough to write a book anyway. We may as well do it in a way that feels enjoyable. Exactly. And I think when you, when you, when you enjoy the writing that comes through in the reading, um, and if, if a writer just hated writing a book, you can usually kind of sniff that out. Yeah. So what about with plot? Because I think with plot, there's clear ways or, or, or clear steps that a writer can take to plan and, and structure a story. I'm certainly, I've done that with my recent book. I love the planning. I love the structuring. But when it comes to voice, the process seems a little bit more elusive. We come back to that, you know, find your voice. So what kind of intentional work can writers do to hone and develop that voice in the way that they might when they're planning and structuring even before they start writing? I think that's a good question. I think, I, I, I think it's quite hard. I think as you, I tend to find you write yourself into the book and, and the voice comes out as you, as you write. Um, so I don't think it's something particularly that you can consciously plan. And if you do, then you'll probably see the joins. Um, in my experience with, with, with plotting and planning, and I, I interview, um, I interview authors for the, for the, for the Reed Sea novel course that I, I teach. And it's, uh, it's, it fascinates me how vary that is from person to person. Um, I had one person interviewed last night who does a lot of planning, but the previous person I interviewed did no planning at all, you know, wanted to see where it went. So in terms of who they were as writers, they were completely opposite ends of the, of the spectrum. Um, I think that phrase I was saying about thinning, thinning out, I think you bring, you bring the voice out in the rewriting. So I would probably get that version down, that first draft down. And then when you go back through, then you can bring the, the, the voice out more specifically. Um, and I think I thinking about books that I've written. It tends to, it tends to click in after a certain point. You, I don't know, you, you've written a few chapters and you're not quite sure. And then, and then it sort of seems to kind of fit in uh, and kind of work kind of properly, but it's not a, it's not something I think you can plan particularly in, in advance. 
I think it's more writing and then, as I say, thinning down and kind of bringing it down when you go back through the material. Yeah, I definitely think that that editing process really helps. It's interesting, actually, because, as you know, I've got a novel which is a split point of view novel. And one of the pieces of feedback I had after the first draft was, can you make the characters more different? Because as the person was reading, they sort of sometimes forgot whose point of view they were in. So at that stage, I then had to go through and sort of make a list of what aspects I would bring out in one of the characters and what aspects I would bring out in the other. But I think I probably needed to have that first draft under my belt to know the characters as well as I did know them to then be able to start to differentiate the voices. I'm not sure if I could have done that in the first draft and sort of before I wrote that first draft. I think it's really hard. I think I think it's one of those bits. I mean, it's true with a lot of writing actually that until you've got a draft down on the page to play with, it's quite hard. Um, and I think you know, it, it's really hard to see how a plot's going to work in theory. Even if you've got it structured, you have to write it and then read it through, and then you can see which bits feel fast or which bits mm. feel slow, which bits need changing. And I think I think it's true with with voice. I think you get into the you get into the zone. I mean, I certainly find usually when I'm writing a manuscript that you you speed up the further into the manuscript you get. And that's, I think, because you know the voice and you know the characters. Um, and so the writing comes kind of more easily. Whereas I think to start with, generally, I find that the writing tends to be a bit slower because you're kind of feeling your way a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I think if you've got concerns, you're not sure about the voice when you're starting writing the first draft, I wouldn't worry. I think that all that mm. can be done later on, further down the line. And I think you'll just have a much better sense once you've got a whole script to go back with and, and play around with. Yeah, that's interesting that you talk about things speeding up because I definitely remember in the first draft of mine, I found one of the characters' chapters a lot easier to write. I would I would write those sections a lot quicker. And I gave myself permission with the second character to almost do like a sketch, like shape a, a shape of where that scene was going. And then I found it a lot easier to then come back and almost decorate the space. I needed to have the the, the bare bones in place. Um, so yes, I'm I'm curious in terms of does is that something that you've come across with some of the other students that you've mentored this? Yeah, I, mean, I think yeah, but I, mean, I think the more the more I the more I teach and more I kind of mentor people, I just think you know every writer is different, and you work out kind of what works for you. And I I always try to not be too prescriptive at all in telling people how to write it's more about how do you write and how can I help you encourage you in, in in the way that you want to write I mean with my own writing I will quite often put down skeleton scenes in dialogue so I can write dialogue quickly so I want to get the the, the broad brush you know the the, the the framework of a scene I can get that down quite quickly and then I will go back and add in description of action and other elements but I can get a sort of rough draft down very quickly in, in that kind of way but then other writers mm -hmm. i know need to write the description first before they start um it just it, it varies from kind of person to person um so as i say it's working out what works for you um rather than thinking you have to do it in a particular way or a particular order and when i when i've worked with authors who have um you know novels with more than one character strand sometimes they're writing them in in sequence Sometimes uh, they're writing one character strand first whilst they're in the kind of zone and in the voice of that character, then writing the other part separately and then kind of putting the two together. Uh, and again, I think everyone just, um, yeah, just approaches it differently it, in, in the same way that you have, um, you know, some, some writers will write in, in Word and some writers will use Scrivener. You know, it, you know it, depending on how your mind works, one is more useful than, than the other, I find. So, so having that, confidence to to feel no one's going to tell me how to write i need to work it out for myself uh, and then it's like how can i help myself once i know which is the best way for me to to write yeah lovely that giving yourself permission to do it your way absolutely what about the opening tom because i feel like well certainly that's the that's the bit that you will send an agent on submission they will literally look at between the first five and fifteen thousand words and they will know so the opening is really where the voice 
has to make its strongest impression. It's that first impression. So how might someone go about really crafting the voice in those opening pages? Are there different things to think about because it's the opening, because it's where everything starts? Well, I think, I, th I think, I think with the, with the, with the start of the novel, um, I always think the key question for me is why now? Uh, I, th I think that that's crucial. Why, why are we dropping the reader into the story at this particular moment? Um, so making that clear, I think is really important. I think getting a sense of, you know, the, 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 the protagonist, um, getting, getting a sufficient amount of information in that you care about that character, but not enough that you slow the, the, the story down. I think all those elements mm -hmm. are important. I think thinking about, well, I suppose it's almost like you could go back to the idea of showing and telling. You can't, you need to kind of show the voice rather than tell the reader the voice. So if you're trying to force the voice in, in those opening, uh, opening pages, then you're kind of doing it the wrong way around. You've kind of got to trust that, um, the writing is there and, and the voice will come out through that. Uh, I, I yeah. would say, um, I think sometimes you can have a book where, uh, on the opening page there, there might be a, you know, is it, there's a turn of phrase or there's a particular image, uh, that kind of, kind of stands out. And, and that's the way for the, the reader to, um, kind of, you know, get in and, and get a feel of what, what this person's like. And quite often I will read a book and there'll be something in that opening kind of sentence or that opening page where I think, okay, this, this is a class act. I'm like, you know, this person can write, but I think it's, I think going back to what that publisher said, it's like a quiet confidence. So if you're, if you're showing off about it, then it's, you're not, you're not doing the job properly. I think you need to let, let the writing kind of speak for itself uh, and have the confidence if the voice is there, that that will come out rather than feeling, I know to do, I need to do a fancy bit of writing in this opening page to kind of really kind of knock the socks off the, off the agent or the editor. I think nine times out of 10, they will probably, probably put the book down if they feel that you're trying too hard. So just, yeah. um, having that confidence to kind of relax into it, I think is kind of really, really important. Um, and the only other thing I would say about beginnings is I, I think they're difficult to quite often. It's something to come back to, um, I think rather than something you, you get right, right at the beginning, you know, you, you will know better where the story should begin once you've written the whole, whole book. And I, I certainly find with beginnings that I've rewritten, you know, repeatedly the starts until I've got the one that feels right, um, yeah. to take your time over it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not an easy structurally. It's, it's really important. The book part of the book to get right. So it's, it was always slightly harsh that for, for a new writer, that's the bit that you're showing to a, you know an agent or an editor rather than a, you know, a nice passage halfway through the, the manuscript or something that you feel kind of showcases what you're, what you're really about. I think also that advice or that experience that you have, it's something that people come back to because often a new writer is just going to get stuck on that first chapter and never get past that first chapter because they're trying to make it perfect but actually it's only in really seeing where the book goes that you can then come back and that question oh my gosh you dropped that question on me in the summer <laughs> I don't know if you remember but I ended up switching my first and my third chapters over and it's interesting because I was thinking about as you were answering that I was thinking about that question why now but also asking it, not just in terms of the action or the plot, but also in terms of what the character is saying in that in those opening pages, what they're seeing. If we come back to that Raymond Carver making the world over or his world and no other, if you ask yourself, why now? You know, let's say I'm describing those jars on the shelf. Why am I describing them now? it sort of starts to give it the voice because it, there's, it gives it that second layer if you're thinking of that question in the background of everything. I, th I think that's right. And I think it's, yeah, you, you use those words carefully and, and, and sparingly, uh, I would say, at the beginning. Uh, I, think, I think one of the biggest dangers is you're trying to impart too much information. Um, so just getting a, you know, a, again, going back to kind of Sally Rooney or, or Raymond Carver, you know, a, a simple scene done well, um, mm. that, that is the start of the plot, is, is, is the way to begin. Um, I'm trying to think of, so I was just looking at my shelves, see if I could see an example off the top of my head. 
Um, all the all the good books are. Um, well, actually, it seems like um, uh, Ham- Hamlet by by Maggie O'Farrell, Ooh, uh, um, which is a book. wonderful book. Yeah. But that that begins with you know with with a the character um, coming down the stairs. I don't even remember it, but it you know it's so yes. simple. A boy is coming like down a flight. Knee or something. Yeah, boy. Boy yeah. is coming down a flight of stairs. The passage is narrow and twists back on itself. Take he takes each step slowly, sliding himself along the wall. His boots meeting each tread with a thud. Um, yeah, near the bottom, he pauses for a moment, looking back. Then suddenly, resolute, he leaps the final three stairs, as is his habit. He stumbles as he lands, falling to his knees on the flagstone floor. Um, and then this 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 next paragraph. It is, it is a close, windless day in late summer, and the downstairs room is slashed by long strips of light. The sun glowers at him from outside, the windows latticed slabs of yellow set into the plaster. And I would say here that if you're thinking about the use of language, we talked about verbs earlier on. Verbs, yeah. You know, the downstairs room is slashed by long strips mm. of light. It's such a brilliant sentence. There's nothing complicated about what's written there, but it, it creates an image, feel, a mood. Uh, you're right there, and I think that's that's sort of everything we've, we've been talking about. Really, you know, the simple, commonplace, precise language. You've got a, I think you've got a sense of voice there immediately without anything difficult being done uh, in terms of the use of language. Uh, but that will have been worked and worked and worked to get to that to that level. Um, but yeah, yeah, if you want an example of a good beginning, that's a yeah, that's that's that's, that's one to one to look at. That's ticking all the boxes. When I heard the slashed, I was like, there's the verb <laughs> doing also, the work. But also resonates the fact that I could open that page and you you immediately know that he's, you know, he's going to kind of fall on his knees. You know, you're, you know, so obviously has kind of lost, you know, you, you, you remember it. It resonates. Oh, that one did because of the flat, uh, the flagstone floor and the knee. Like I felt the pain in that moment as well. So yeah. it lodged in my mind. And also the other thing that comes to me, Tom, in terms of beginnings and in terms of that distinct voice and in terms of that confidence, there's a difference between reading an opening page or an opening pages and I don't feel like I'm in safe hands and I'm confused versus reading some opening pages and there's lots of questions arising in my mind but they feel like they're being invited because I feel like I'm trusting the reader and I'm very curious about the images that they're giving me the way the characters are say moving so can you do do you know what I'm talking about that distinction between I don't feel like I'm in safe hands and I'm just confused versus oh I'm I'm I feel like my I'm being enticed and tickled with curiosity here yeah I think I mean, I, I teach a lesson on what I call kind of grounding the reader. I, I think, I think you, as early as possible, you want to, to, you want the reader to feel that they're in safe hands. I think that's really important, and that's partly about setting and, and place, both in terms of the where and, and, and the when, so they know precisely, you know, where where the action is is, is happening, um, and that's also in terms of describing the characters too. I think it's. It's one of those my sort of pet hates where you have a you know you introduce a character and then on page ten you suddenly find that he's got a moustache or he's wearing glasses or something that hasn't been hasn't been mentioned kind of previously. I think that kind of stuff is kind of really really important uh, to, uh, to 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 get right. Um, I also think for me, I always say that um, the more you can write in scenes, I, I think that really uh, that helps kind of ground and kind of set the text. I think when the text is kind of floating. Uh, and we're just in a character's thoughts, or we're not quite sure where we are. That's where it feels, um, you know, confusing. Um, so keeping it clear. So going back to that Maggie O'Farrell example, there, you know, we know exactly who we're with. You know, he's going down the stairs, and then actually, as that page goes on, it sort of opens out, and you know, you know, precisely kind of where we are. So I think keeping it within a scene, within a moment. Um, so scenes rather than summary, I think, are kind of really, really important. Uh, to get right, and I, I always say that the, the more you can base the book uh, and the story around specific scenes, the stronger uh, the pull will be on the on the reader. Mm, I love that scenes rather than summary. That, yeah. That's a really lovely way. So that I could see that as a very useful post-it note to have when you're working on something. 
I think particularly at the beginning, I mean, I think once you've got the scene up and running, then there may be a moment, a natural pause where you can drop in a little bit of summarised information mm. or something like that. Uh, but I think at the start, get the scene up and running, make clear exactly to the reader where we are. Uh, and then once they feel secure, then they will focus on what you want them to focus on, which is the plot and the characters. If they're kind of reading the text and thinking, well, I'm not quite sure where we are or what point of view are we looking at this from or any of that kind of stuff, then they're not focusing in what they should be focusing in on and you're losing them for the for the key points of what the story is about. Yeah. We've been talking about this idea of thinning down to find that voice. So that first draft can be a bit scrappy, can be a sketch, can be just dialogue, and then you start to paint everything around. You can find the voice in later drafts. I'm curious, Tom, in your editing days, which I know haven't ended, but uh, I'm sort of referring to them as in the past, but yeah. when you've got your editing hat on, are there moments when you're reading something and you think something is compromising the authenticity of a piece or compromising the voice? So you have a sense of like maybe something's holding it back or maybe there's something, you know, it still needs to be thinned down. If so, how do you go about addressing that? I'm sort of thinking if someone's here like, yes, I do need to thin down my piece or yes, I don't think I've, 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 got, I've got that piece of marble just right. Something's compromising the voice. How might they go about addressing that? I think, I think sometimes it's about balance. Uh, so I sometimes talk about editing being a bit like um, an accordion. So you're, you're kind of on concertina where there's, there's bits where you're kind of kind of compacting down and there's other bits that you're kind of expanding out. So I, I tend to find when I'm editing that there will be sections where actually I think um, the writer has gone through the material too quickly uh, and that needs to be written out in more detail. Um, I think there's a, there's a bit about understanding about time um, by which I mean that uh, time isn't linear in a in a novel or, or, or actually in how we kind of experience the, 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 the world, you have those moments where big things happen. And when those happen in a book then you can, you can write them in huge amounts of detail, almost in slow motion. Uh, and I think quite often I find that, that new writers don't, don't get that. Um, there's a, there's a quote from Lee Child where he says, write the fast stuff slow and the slow stuff fast. And I think that's a really, really nice phrase. I think when you've got the, the slow stuff, you can whap through that, you know, whip through it kind of very, very quickly. And if you've got the fast stuff, then you can really slow down and tell the reader they want to see that moment in as much detail as possible. And also you want to create um, a sufficient build that, that when you hit that moment, that you it has the kind of the maximum dramatic impact that you want. Um, so so I think with editing, it's a, it's a two-way process. Some of it, I, I, I will go back with the notes and say, okay, this bit needs writing out. Some of it, quite often, I think you can cut to the chase a lot quicker. Um, so I, I know when I when I write a scene with my own writing, when I go back and edit, I can normally just take out the first two paragraphs without even blinking, because I know that I will have written myself into the scene and I'm sort mm -hmm. of setting it up and going. And quite often I'll find I'll just literally put a line through the first two paragraphs and then it gets moving that much more quickly. Um, there's a, there's a line from screenwriting uh, about uh, well, scene writing or writing generally about arriving late and leaving early. And again, I think that is really, really good uh, advice in terms of shaping a scene. Don't don't hang around before the thing gets going. Drop the reader in. Uh, halfway through a conversation is often quite a good moment to begin a scene. So you're 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 in the action straight away and get out before things will kind of dribble down to a conclusion as well. Find that find that point where the key key stuff happens and then kind of move on. Uh, or as Raymond Garver said, you know, get in, get out, don't linger. Yeah, I love that. I'm just making a note of that. Arrive late, leave early. That's such a lovely way to put it. And loving the sort of idea of that concertina, the Lee Child writing those fast scenes slow and the slow scenes fast. I I've had it because I've I've read a few I've read a few really fantastic thrillers recently. And I've really noticed that, like in the absolute key moment, suddenly everything's being described so that the scene is really, really slow. And as the reader, I mean, I'm literally just like, oh, I, 
And I'm having to really be quite disciplined to not sort of jump ahead to the next page. I think there's a fine line between giving the reader that, oh my God, like just tell me what's about to happen and holding them enough, but not too long so that they don't start skipping ahead. Like, do you have a sense of, of that nuance and how you might be able to tell if you've, if you've stretched that concertina too much? I think, I think that's quite hard to pick up as, as, as your own writing. I, th I think readers are really important there and getting feedback is, 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 is the best way of seeing whether you're, whether you're losing them or whether it's too much or too little. Um, I was just thinking as you were talking, going back to, um, uh, it's slightly different, but kind of, you know, football matches, if you're watching match of the day or, or, or whatever, where you'll have, you'll have the, the, the match first and then you will have the sort of post match analysis and you'll go back and back over the key moments because actually as the as the person who's been interested in the match you want to watch that goal again and work out why it happened and so you so you're doing it in a not in slow motion but you're getting that in a lot more detail so something on the pitch that will happen over 10 seconds you may then have like five minutes of discussion around it uh, and i suppose in a similar way in a novel it's those big moments are actually if the character's been shot or whatever it is you can you can slow that right down uh, and, and, and see that from, you know, different angles, different perspectives, um, mm. and, and really allow the reader to soak it up. I suppose the difference in the novel to the, you know, that kind of TV format is you're, you're witnessing it once. So you are watching it in kind of in real time, but, but learning about pacing, I think partly comes through, you've got to have the draft and then rewrite it. Uh, but then also, as I say, it's about getting reads and seeing where people are excited, uh, and where they are getting bored. Yes, I do think that second pair of eyes is so important, especially because I've certainly given feedback on some of my own clients' work where I've been in one of those fast moments but written slow. And I think the way that you write that slow, so for example, you can slow it down by lots of detail and description, or you can slow it down by having the character almost have like an internal commentary and I think they're both great, but in some scenes when they're slowing it down because there's too much internal thought, you sort of lose, you lose the energy because suddenly this very physical moment becomes too intellectual. So I think, again, that's why it's so great to have that second pair of eyes. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think the more you can show it through action rather than thought, uh, I, I think, I think it's definitely useful. I think you know, description is, is a natural way of kind of slowing a, a scene down. Um, I think foreshadowing also is, is really useful here that you're hinting to the reader that it's worth hanging around because something bad is about to happen. You know, I think you can use that kind of extremely well. Um, and certainly when you go back in with the rewriting, dropping in little, little breadcrumbs like that to keep them there, uh, I, I think it's also kind of really, really useful. But yeah, it's, you know, I was talking earlier about movement, but making sure that characters are you know, physically doing stuff, um, I think is, 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 is really important. And again, it's easy to miss out. It's very easy just to slip into character kind of stood there having kind of, you know, having some thoughts or thinking your way to themselves and what you need is to have them doing something actively. Um, yeah, that's how doing, advice. yeah, I was always, do, doing, I always say, which is not very, there must be a, a more kind of, um, sophisticated way of there saying that. There must be a better verb for yes. that, Tom. Yeah. For doing, doing stuff is, is good. Doing stuff. So we've been talking about the writer's voice, but one thing I did, Tom, before I jumped on with you, I went and had a look at my bookshelves and I was looking a bit like you did when you, when you picked out Hamnet. Um, I was looking over the shelves and it occurred to me that some books stood out because of the writer's voice, because I'm like, oh, um, actually I, I was noticing a, a Sally Rooney as I was looking at my shelves. Um, and some books stood out because of the character's voice. And of course, I suppose that comes back to, is it written in first person or is it written in third person? But I think even if a book is written in third person, you can still have it as that very close third person. So it does feel like it's the character narrating. So I'd love for you to just make a little bit of a distinction here. We've got the authentic 
writer's voice that is distinct, but we've also got possibly the character's voice, which is distinct. So help help people understand a bit more there. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's more separate in, in third person. If you're writing in first person, uh, then I think it's quite hard to separate out the author's voice from that character's voice. They tend to kind of, the, the, the voice of the book tends to be, you know, Bridget Jones or wh whoever it is that you're, you're you know, uh, Eleanor Oliphant or you know whoever, whoever you is 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 the voice of the book. Uh, in the in the third person, I think it's it's a it's a bit more complicated where you've got, as you say, the the, the voice of the, of the character uh, and then the you know the, the the voice of the of the author as well. Uh, and so having a little bit of separation there, I think is uh, is 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 important for those characters to stand out. So you want you want to be with that character. You want ultimately you want the, the reader to care about that character but i suppose it's being aware and thinking about their um perhaps their limitations in terms of how they would see the world mm. so if you're you know if you if your character is a football hooligan they're probably not going to appreciate the the beauty of the of the nature as they walk through a park or, or, or whatever or if they or if they're you know your 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 character is a you know a young child they're not going to have that knowledge or understanding and pick up certain things about how people are, how they behave. So I think it's understanding or finding ways of kind of separating that out. Uh, I, I think it's really useful. Um, I think it also gives you, give you scope as a writer. Um, so you can, through a character's viewpoint, steer the reader in a certain direction. Um, so if they are visiting a scene that you're seeing that scene through their eyes, uh, I think, and I, I think one of the things that's key, really, particularly when you're writing in third person, is to keep that um, that narrative voice or that authorial hand to an absolute kind of bare minimum. You don't want to feel that there's someone behind the scenes moving kind of pieces around. Uh, so, so making, creating the space for those characters to live and breathe, and leaving the reader the space to draw their own judgments and conclusions. I, I think is is, is crucial. Uh, and actually, I think. Which we haven't talked about particularly, but um, one one of the important things sometimes with voice is that you almost don't notice that it's there. So one of my one of my favourite writers is, is John Le Carre, and I think one of the reasons that John Le Carre is such a brilliant writer is for me I don't really notice the writing. Uh, I do when I go back when I'm when I'm teaching. I'm trying to think about why this is working, but he's he's in the background. He's letting the the story. And then the character do the talking and giving them the space to do, and he's not allowing the writing to get in the way. The writing is there for him to kind of facilitate um, the, the the narrative and the character and the novel. Um, so if you're writing in third person, there is a separation between kind of character and and, and uh, the narrative voice. But as I say, that narrative voice for me should almost be invisible rather than steering the reader too strongly. Yes, I like that, and also that comment that the voice can become invisible and that's a, that's a good thing and I suppose when we're writing in first person and so that character is right there then we also have to navigate the moments where there's other characters and their dialogue of course if you're describing them you can stay with that character's voice but then as soon as you start writing the dialogue that's a really careful place isn't it because you've got to suddenly make a distinction and bring in new voices yeah and if you're writing in first person that's the only way to get other viewpoints in really i think you have to work quite hard at that point to get other characters in because otherwise you're just seeing everything and hearing everything through the fil through the filter of that first person protagonist so yeah i think i think sort of dialogue in the, uh yeah in a in a first person book is really really important particularly if you're wanting to say to the reader not everything you're hearing from this character is true. If you're if you're writing a book with a unreliable narrator, it's it's the dialogue, it's the bit that they can't um, they can't filter. Um, yeah. Really, you just you just get that sort of unexpurgated. So then you're as as the reader, that's your moment when you can see things in a slightly different way. Yeah. Tom, this has been such a beautiful masterclass for me, and the time is absolutely shocked by this is a case when i wish the i wish we could kind of concertina it and, and stretch it out a little bit more <laughs> we can um, fast stuff slow yeah <laughs> yeah 
I'd love to just just to sort of pause. Um, I mean, I know that you're working on your own novel and you did sort of share that you've got certain ways and you tend to sort of make more discoveries with later drafts. But is there anything that I didn't ask you when it comes to voice or anything that sort of occurred to you as we've been chatting today that you want to share just as a few parting words? I, th I think we've probably covered most of it. I mean, I, th I think the thing I would say in particular is is having that, having that kind of confidence to to, the, to let the voice come out, um, and that, that doesn't have to be loud. You know, it can be a, a quiet uh, a voice, a kind of quiet confidence that I think is really, really uh, powerful. Um, I always say, write the book that you want to write. I, I think that is so important. I think anybody chasing a market. I just don't think it's it's worth it. You've you've got to write the book that you want to write, and if that chimes with what publishers looking for, fantastic. But if not, then you've written the book that you want to write, and you've got something there that you're proud of. Um, and I think my experience with my own writing, and also kind of teaching people to write, is how much you learn about yourself through the process. Um, and so you will get that either way. And I, I think for me, that's that's as important as anything else when when you write. It's a it's a journey of um discovery so although we although i was saying that you, it's not a process of finding your voice i think you you find out something about yourself in, in the writing as you work through a novel so that is the thing to to hold on to um yeah and don't don't feel pushed around by the by the market or the steel or anything else in, in that kind of way i, th I think that's what i would like to to, to leave kind of uh, viewers and, and, and listeners with because mm. yes, i love that reminder of that word confidence because I think I mean you mentioned that right at the start and actually that's something that really struck me Tom the difference between say we might see someone who is supposedly confident and they're they're acting loud and they're strutting around and we sort of think oh that's what confidence is but actually you're saying no 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 the confidence is about letting that voice be there so that voice might be quiet that voice might be incredibly minimal that might that voice might use really simple language and i think that is the thing that makes those agents go hang on a second i can't quite define this but something's happening here yeah and i think when i start uh, teaching a course that the, the in that strange way the students who who worry me are the students who have, are, are quite kind of full of themselves and, and just want to be told that they're great and and the ones who i think are the ones to look out for or listen to who, who are the ones who are you know worried about being there not not sure about being there have got imposter syndrome and i think if you if you don't feel worried or vulnerable at some point when you're writing then you're not doing it right. You haven't got the requisite level of sensitivity that you need to be a, a real writer. Um, so with, with with some writers, I think when I'm teaching them, it's about me as a tutor giving them the confidence that they're they're good and they can do it. Um, and the ones who just come in and, and say they're brilliant, I yeah, they they tend to kind of fall on their faces. I have to say, and that they're the ones that I I, I sort of worry about kind of more in, in a strange kind of way. Yes, I love that. Sensitivity is required. Beautiful. Definitely. Tom, thank you so much. So I know that you're teaching with Reedsy. Where, if someone's watched this and thought, I need some more of Tom Bromley, what's the best way that they can get in touch with you? So, uh, well, two things. So if you're interested in the in the course, the, the website is reedsy.com slash learning. Uh, and the novel course starts uh, every so often. So the next one is towards the end of October, if you're interested in that. And if you go to the website, you can see... Uh, information there um, or you can go to my website which is just tombromley.co.uk and there's ways of getting hold of me through there if you wanted to co contact me directly brilliant we'll pop those links below tom thank you so much very welcome this has been a, been a pleasure